What is going on with Grace Community Church in John MacArthur in California? I'm about to tell you. I'm about to tell you why it matters. You're listening to Cornfield Theology. Hey everyone, what's going on? Pastor Sean here with Redemption Hill Church with you uh, doing another Cornfield Theology. I am solo. Um, I got something pressing on my mind in which I just want to share and just help process with you if you've been in, you know, reading the headlines or the social media feed or whatever else have you, and, and it's this. What do we do with John MacArthur, man? Now, PSA, um, a full disclosure. I've never been a fan of John MacArthur, right? I just, you know, he's kind of like a squishy dispensationalist, and I'm not a fan of dispensational, dispensational theology at all. And he's kind of like this reformed, squishy dispensational and... You know, he, and just because you know he doesn't, he's not my preference. Doesn't mean like he can't be your preference or whatever. Um, and I and I do want to say like he he clearly has years of faithfulness and integrity in the ministry, so I commend that. But you know, I've never been an avid John MacArthur reader, which isn't to say he hasn't done a lot of good. I think he absolutely has, just not my fave, and that's okay. But what do we do with him now, right? I mean, he's gotten older. He, you know what he reminds me of right now, and then we'll get to the issue at hand. He reminds me of my dad. I love my dad. My dad, and he and I disagree on a lot as he's gotten older in his age, though. He's become, uh, I don't know, a little more stubborn, I guess. A little stuck in his ways. And, you know, I can be stubborn as well. And so, you know, we'll talk politics. And there's just no moving my pops from, you know, a political view. You know, he's in his 70s. Like, yeah, this is what I believe. I'm good. Yeah, MacArthur's kind of like that. <laughs> he's just He's just calling it as he sees it. And uh, sometimes that's not great, uh, as we've seen in the past. And sometimes it's like, oh, well, that's helpful. You're, you're speaking out loud what everyone is thinking. And um, he's done that recently, I think. Uh, here, here's, here's the context. John MacArthur, he, uh, he pastors a church, um, Grace Community Church in California, um, you know, we're in the cornfields here. He's in California. So uh, I mentioned that because how his state has gone about COVID-19 and lockdowns and all that kind of stuff is different than the state of Iowa. The state of Iowa is different than, you know, Illinois and all the neighbors, whatever else have you. And uh, they've been like locked down. Churches aren't supposed to meet. And uh, here in um, Iowa, you know, we've never really had a lockdown. Now we've been encouraged to social distance, wear masks and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we've never had like, you cannot meet, you know, maybe we had it for 14 days or something, but I even think churches were exempt early on in the COVID pandemic. Um, so we, we've always been able to meet or at least had the opportunity to, um, we've done a lot online, so we haven't met, um, you know, when, when the pandemic first broke out, but more recently in the last two months, it it seems we've been meeting in a park and it's been fine. Uh, No problems. Well, even California, from what I understand, they can't even meet in a park. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's crazy. Even when you look at the data and the science, and I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, but generally speaking, when you're outside social distancing, you're not, you're not running into problems in terms of uh, community spread. So California has been really strict, really tight. And the question is, what do you do with that, right? If I was a pastor in California, I got to imagine because of my high theology or ecclesiology um, that I would be pushing back as well. And I'm not saying the way that John MacArthur has gone about it and his elders at Grace Community Church has has been perfect every step of the way, but I I agree with the sentiment. I agree with kind of the impulse um, in in terms of um, needing to gather as a local church. And so the question gets comes into, what do we do with that? And especially in terms of our relationship with government, right? So MacArthur, basically, I can remember me a month ago now, from the time of this recording, was basically like, we're meeting. <laughs> Gavin Newsom, the governor, the great governor of California. Um, you know, you can say whatever you want, Gavin Newsom. MacArthur's like, uh-uh, we're meeting. And uh, we're gonna, we don't care. And if you're going to find us, find us. We're going to meet. And so they met. And uh, MacArthur even took it to court. And, you know, I think it was, oh, he won the first round, lost the second round, won the third round or something like that. And now the, and now, now the state of California is basically saying, well, we're, we're going to take things away from you. Uh, basically, Grace Community Church have been leasing out a parking lot nearby for, for, their, for Sunday attendance, right? So people could have somewhere to park. And um, 
basically they took it away. <laughs> you know, Grace Community Church, if I remember correctly, was paying over eight grand a month to lease out this parking space. And the state's like, or whoever, whatever, whatever a board is over that, over parking lots in California, they basically said no. So there's a clear tit for tat here going on. And um, it's interesting to watch. Now, different evangelical leaders have, um, you know, gave their opinion. You know, everyone from like Jonathan Lehman of Nine Marks Ministry, who in his own passive aggressive way basically said John, Mark, John MacArthur is doing the wrong thing. You got Gospel Coalition. Who, interestingly enough, you know, took the took the position of Jonathan Lehman, and all of a sudden we started seeing these John MacArthur like short blip videos, <laughs> not a, not about what's going on at their local church, but just you know past teachings or whatever. It was almost like, what, what are you doing? You, you just you you're gonna like say no, he shouldn't be meeting. He should be obeying the government authorities, and then you're gonna like start peddling his stuff on social media. I'm like, well, Gospel Coalition is so weird sometimes, but I don't know what they got going on. And so just various opinions within the evangelical world. And again, it comes down to what do we do with um, submitting to the government? So we got a couple passages to consider. And when we think about um, should we submit to government and to what degree? Everyone and their brother, you know, if you've been a, a Christian for longer than a cup of coffee and this topic of church and government comes up, they're like, Romans 13, Romans 13, Romans, and rightfully so, Romans 13. So... The obligatory but very necessary Romans 13 says this, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And mind you, during this time when when Paul wrote, uh, the governing authorities weren't that kind to Christians or Jews in some cases, right? Um, Claudius Caesar at one point kicked all the Jews out of Rome. So we see that in the book of Acts. Um, But here we have... Nonetheless, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. So Paul here is kind of like laying out a hierarchy. (laughs) We have authority from God, and God is the one who institutes those governing authorities. And it continues in Romans 13, verse 1, and that those exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur incur judgment. So MacArthur asked the question, are you going to incur judgment from God, John MacArthur, because you have resist authority, the governing authorities of the state, the great state of California, Gavin Newsom? I don't know. I'm not so sure. Um, I think think we have to be um, patient as Christians to quickly judge what is going on in a place, in a context that is not ours. Again, I I can imagine what the elders at Grace Community Church have to to process, have to think through. We just don't have the same political climate here in the motherland, here in the cornfields of Iowa. And so let's not be quick to judge. And and I mean, think there's some passages within Scripture that we we can look and say, hmm, Yes, we're supposed to submit to our governing authorities, but what what if those governing authorities are unjustly telling us we can and cannot do something? It violates uh, scripture or our conscience, right? What if that's the case? Do you still obey? I mean, here's your real silly example, but totally makes the point. Uh, What if the governing authorities say, hey, we want you to go steal from your neighbor, right? Go do that. Well, you don't do that. Right, you're, just, you're violating um, scripture at that point, so you don't do it. Uh, governing authorities could tell you not to do something. Right, uh, you cannot eat. <laughs> well, no, I can eat and I should eat. I'm not going to starve myself because, you know, governing authorities tell me to not eat or whatever. You know, so those are outlandish examples, but they're trying to make a point here. The governing authorities have limits into which what they're able to. Uh, tell people to do or to not do, and when it violates scripture and conscience, and I think Christians need to circumvent, go around those governing authorities, and look to God. That's exactly what Daniel did. When you read the book of Daniel, you're just amazed at two things that stick out in the entire book. There's other things, of course. One, God is completely sovereign over the kings he raises up, and then the kings he humbles. Totally sovereign over that. I go to that a lot when I think about how God is sovereign over the governing authorities. Number two, if the governing authorities are going to tell you to not do something and it impacts your 
um, your faith and what you believe about your faith in God and what God is calling you to do, then I think there's some liberty to be like, uh-uh. So what happens in Daniel, right? Go to Daniel 6 for a moment. You don't have to turn there, but you certainly can. I'll just paint the story for you here. Uh, there's a new king, King Darius, you know, and so he becomes king and all of a sudden um, all his underlings are like, we really don't like this guy, Daniel, and he's religious and he loves God and he's always praying and we need to get him out because he has power and authority that we want. And this is the best way to, the best way to kind of get him out is to uh, realize we're going to attack the very thing that he loves the most, God. And so uh, these little, these little weasels, right, of under King Darius, they go to him right after he's, you know, feeling good. He's, he's, he's now king of Babylon. And they say, the king should establish an order, an ordinance and enforce an injunction. That whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast to the lions. You know, the famous story, um, the biblical story of uh, Daniel in the lion's den. You know, so basically, if uh, if uh, Daniel's going to pray to his god, Yahweh, then you know what we're going to do. We're going to take Daniel and throw him in the lion's den. And then you dip down a couple more verses, and it's worth saying and reading this. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, because King Darius is like, yeah, sure, you know, whatever, whatever these guys said. You know, they've been around for a while. Um, when, when that was signed, he went to his house where he had the windows in the upper room open, <laughs> and he prayed toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. He was not going to let government to determine how it is he was going to worship his God. That's where government absolutely can overstep and has overstepped um, as we even look at history. That's been the case. What do we have going on in California? How does that fit here? Now, is the government saying, you cannot do this because we don't like church? Well, in California, I'm not going to put that past them, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like... California is a really secular state. And uh, while many churches exist in California, generally speaking, within the government, not too friendly toward churches in general. And that's a whole different uh, podcast when we talk about the rise of um, this, like neo Marxism's going on and how that's in infected in, <laughs> I say infected, some governments and especially these liberal states. I mean, calling California liberal and not a fan of churches is not a stretch. It really isn't. Now, are there local communities that like their churches and stuff like that? Of course. But liberalism in general, I mean, there's a reason why liberal churches in general are on the massive decline. Because that particular ideology doesn't allow for uh, faith in God. It, it, it allows for faith in government. So, different different podcasts for another day. So, I'm not shocked that, you know, the Gavin News in the state of California and are not happy with with uh, Grace Community Church. And so just keep that in mind. And, and you know, does this apply here? I, I think it can. I think John MacArthur and the elders at Grace Community Church are the ones who ultimately need to determine that. Now, I will admit, is there was it necessary that for a season that people not gather together because we just didn't know what was going on with COVID? Of course. That we didn't gather. We went completely online. We were um, being cautious, not only because we're just trying to trying to take the information that was being given to us through the CDC or through our local governing authorities and say, okay, we want to respect that. There was a time and place for it, absolutely. Uh, now with more information and now more understanding about how to fight COVID nineteen, uh, can we can we can we go about gathering in a way that is wise and responsible? I think so. I think we must do so. Um, so that means social distancing, wearing masks, things like that. That We have to allow space to be able to do it. And, and then I'll even say this, right? And this is where if I'm John MacArthur and I'm looking at the uh, the landscape of America, I'm getting frustrated. And, I'm, and, I, and I would be with him on this. Like all of our health experts were saying, you know, do not meet, shut everything down, do not meet, shut everything down. And then we have protests and then rioters and all the, all the things going on in America right now. And where are, where's Dr. Fauci? Where, where are our health experts saying, do not gather? They're not saying a word. So in, in a sense, you got to be like, whoa, come on now. 
I mean, that's not a, that's not a that's not a value judgment statement on peaceful protesting at all. That is not what I'm saying. It's just very inconsistent. We're not going to say we're the protesters over here, but we don't want you gathering in church over here. No, that doesn't fly. It didn't fly for John MacArthur, and it shouldn't fly for anyone. You have to see the inconsistencies there. Whatever you think of church, whatever you think of protesting, you have to see the inconsistency. You have to be intellectually honest with what's going on. Well, you think John MacArthur, you would think I just told you everything you need to say, need to know about John MacArthur, but man, that guy is not done. <laughs> what did he say last Sunday? He called COVID-19, I think it was a hoax. You know, there's no pandemic. And uh, he, he gave some rationales. Or I saw the video, it was a, like a two-minute clip or whatever. It was just a roar from from the crowd. Now, I, I'm not going that far uh, with John MacArthur. I'm I, The reason why, even though I have my questions, even though I have my suspicions, and I've been very um, frustrated with the inconsistencies, um, whether it's from the CDC or WHO or even our, our government in general about what we should do or shouldn't do. And, you know, the, the, the goalpost keeps, keeps moving, it feels like. And that's highly frustrating whether you're a business owner or, you know, my situation, I'm a pastor of a church. Why can't you? The goalpost keeps moving. And sometimes it's warranted, but we have to recognize as well, a lot of this is political. You know, if you don't recognize it's not political, then you're naive. Anything that can be used to be political toward the other party, it's going to be used. And let's just be really honest about it. And so, like, people are going to go to the polls in November, and until then, everything is political. You know, I got my dog Winston right here, right in front of me, kind of laying down and chilling out. If the Democrats or the Republicans could, you know, use my dog to be political for their gain, they're going to do it. <laughs> That's not being, uh, uh, sorry, I'm not trying to be sarcastic or anything like that. I'm just trying to be really honest. And so COVID-19 has become intensely political. Should kids go back to school? Should they not go back to school? You know, um, you know, whatever Trump says, the Democrats say, take the opposite side. Whatever the Democrats say, you know, Republicans and Trump take the opposite side. And so it, let's just be honest. It's become really political, which makes it really aggravating in terms of trying to navigate this particular situation. So I'm not I'm not I'm not on board with what, uh, you know, John MacArthur said about being a hoax. Um, I think it is true. People have died from COVID-19, but I'm also not going to be naive, naive. I'm going to acknowledge it has been politicized. And sometimes it can be politicized toward and against the church. Here's another example, Nevada. Um, there was a church in Nevada that had sued the state of Nevada because they were letting uh, people go to the casino. Obviously, the casino business in Nevada is massive. You got Las Vegas. And so there, there's a ton of money that needs to go into the casino. I remember Albert Moeller talking about this on his briefing, uh, you know, maybe it was a month back or or so, but you couldn't gather for church. And so the point that um, the church was making that was suing um, the government in Nevada is basically saying, we just want to be treated equally. We just want to be treated equally. But the, but the state of Nevada is basically picking and choosing what is and is not essential. Like gambling is essential. I mean, I understand that there are jobs connected to the casino industry, but that, that's a hard pass for me. If you, if you say that government or that the uh, casinos are essential, but churches are not. Like there's a worldview behind that in order to come to that particular conclusion. So that particular case goes to the Supreme Court and the, basically the Supreme Court says, you know, yeah, we're going to side with the state of Nevada. Long story short, there's more to it, of course. It, it just gives you a window into kind of the nonsense going on, the politicate, the how everything's become so political um, during a time of COVID-19, during a time of where there is uh, uh, peaceful protesting along with rioting and looting, right? Uh, and again, we got to be mindful of that. So I want to acknowledge COVID-19. People have died from COVID-19. As a pastor of a local church, we want to take precautions. We've been meeting outdoors because we want to take um, caution to the reality. We also, as Christians, we cannot be held in fear because of COVID-19. Listen, if you're a Christian and you're listening or watching this on YouTube, don't be held in fear of COVID-19. You are free from that because of Christ. The only, in the Bible, the only place where the only place fear has in the Christian life is fear of God. You notice that? Nowhere else do we 
we're, act, we're called to do the opposite when we look at our circumstances or the world. We're to not fear our circumstances of the world, but trust God. And so in these days, we needed it. So here's some more thoughts about COVID-19 and how we've gone about um, trying to be responsible, um, but also not be held captive. Like I said, we've been meeting outdoors, and that's been good. And there'll come a point where winter does come, right? And uh, we need to facilitate something indoors. And we want to do everything we can to protect. We want to social distance, right? Sanitize, um, wear masks, and um, whether, whatever you believe about masks, right? I got questions about it. Here's some data points that are, the data points seems to be wildly inconsistent. But you know what? If, if wear a mask ultimately means that we can worship together as a local church, I'll put on the mask, you know? You know, whatever you feel about mask, if you're an anti-masker, wouldn't you want to lay down that particular opinion or preference in order to gather with the church? Yeah, I think so. That's, that's what I believe. Um, it's not about getting your way all the time. It's about being together and gathering as a local church. And so those are some of the thoughts that we have wrestled with. It's kind of the direction we've gone as a local church. And it's what a lot of local churches are doing, constantly trying to think well about others, wanting to love others well in this really confusing and and really difficult to navigate. And here, here's one last thought before we end this particular cornfield theology. People are all over the spectrum on COVID-19, mass, BLM, um, you know, the, the peaceful protesting to the rioting and the looting. People have various opinions. And what there's no better opportunity for the church to love well. Love each other well, even when we disagree, and love the world well. The world that we're trying to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, go back to what I, what I started with. Like, how do we engage? Um, what do we do when the government's saying no, right? And when you read Romans 13, we look at a situation like the book of Daniel. We have 1 Peter uh, 2, 17, which is love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. <laughs> you know, honor the emperor. Well, the way forward is to love well. What did Christ do? Uh, he, he was the greatest example of love that we read about in the scriptures. A self-sacrificial love that he took to the cross. Right? I think of Philippians 2, where... You know, in humility, he took the hard road we could not do for ourselves. I think about what we read in the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, How do you know that I've loved you? I've laid my life down for you. And as Christians, we need to do that for one another. We need to love well in the church. We wanna we wanna we want the we want the world to look in and be like, Whoa, that's different than all the barking and the yelling and the screaming that we see on the news outlets and social media. We can actually do this well. We can love well. Even if even if you're in a situation where, yeah, I'm going to uphold Romans 13 for our circumstances or, or the book of Daniel, right? Uh, Daniel, because he was defying the government, wasn't all of a sudden, he didn't cease to love well. I, I'd argue the opposite. He, he wanted to honor God and love others well. You know, and, and if the circumstance, if, if there are consequences for him loving God, yeah, you, you take the circumstances. It is what it is. But it doesn't mean he ceased loving well because he defied the government. I don't think John MacArthur is not loving others well by doing what they're doing. And as Christians, we just need to be patient. Patient with one another and loving one another well. Well, that's it for now. I hope that's helpful for you all. Um, again, hopefully our next Cornfield Theology podcast, we'll, uh, I'll have someone else, uh, maybe Logan, bumping back on and enjoying the conversation. But until next time, I hope you guys are, stay well, uh, stay safe, and God bless, and uh, peace out. Thanks.